Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we continue this week's study, as we address different topics from Daniel 11, shall we praise our Heavenly Father for his direction and guidance and for the wisdom that he is imparting so that we may truly understand that which we are looking at at this time? Shall we ask him for his guidance for his blessing, and for our minds to be opened to understanding that which we need for this time. Shall we now pray? Loving Father in heaven, there is much that we do not understand. There are many points, many examples that we are seeing within these passages that we have not considered before. Open our minds direct our thoughts, help us to consider our words before we speak. As we open your word today, may we keep in mind that you are holding future in your, in your hands, that you know the end from the beginning better than we. May your will be done. Help us now. Guide us. May your angels attend us. May your spirit open our minds and help us to be able to explain what we are about to discuss. Guide us now, we ask. Direct us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, we were addressing this portion yesterday in our conversation. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Who is it that pollutes the sanctuary of strength? Well, the way that we had uh, looked at this was the Edict of Theodosius in 391. Okay. So, so that's, that's the conclusion that we had come to. So in other words, <clears throat> the Edict of Theodosius... 70 years before Constantine's declaration of resting on the venerable day of the sun. Well, well, 391? 391 to 321. Yeah, 70 years after. 70 years after, okay. Yeah. Okay, because I thought you said before. But yeah, yeah, I probably did, because okay. I'm B.C. more than A.D. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, 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 you know, they say between 389 and 391, um, we have this, it's, a, it's a, a practical ban on paganism. That's what Wikipedia okay. says. So visits to the temples were forbidden, remaining pagan holidays were abolished, and the sacred fire of the temple of Vestas in the Roman form was extinguished as the Vestal virgins were disbanded. And auspices and witchcraft were deemed punishable offenses okay so so he's this um, emperor right or co-emperor whatever of the eastern part of the roman empire right right in 392 he becomes emperor of the whole empire so he's the okay. last he was emperor of, of the entire empire so so that's what we have there. So polluting the sanctuary of strength, that's that's what we had uh, put in our notes. Uh, and I think that was that Stephen who brought that one out. Now, it was interesting, too, that we had at the end of the study yesterday that we had looked at 508 and 538 in relation to the Sunday law. So, so what we have right now, um, and I probably should draw this out, is you know, if we we get three twenty one here, I'm gonna. Why don't Why don't you go ahead and draw it out? Yeah, I'll draw it out. You guys can watch me draw it out. How long it takes to do? So we got five hundred eight and five thirty eight in this diagram. So I'm just gonna duplicate this diagram here. So this is the duplicate slide, and and so what we're gonna do here? I'll just get rid of some things. But we got three twenty one. Uh, I'm gonna put over here three ninety one. So you just get rid of a bunch of this other stuff. So we're going to have 70 years here, right? Right. 508 and 538. Um, 
So then we're going to, so I'm going to get rid of all this stuff, but we'll just, so when we go from 321 to 538, we have this as 217 years, right? Okay. Now, of course, the 217 years is uh, 31 times 7, right? So it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's also midnight, right? It's the symbol of July uh, 21st. It's, it's the Battle of Raffi in 217. It's half of uh, the 62 weeks, right? So 62 weeks is 343. So, or 434, pardon me. So if you double 217, you get 434. Um, and then we noticed from 321, Oh, yeah, because that was different. So that's going to be 187 years to 508. Okay, Miller's. Let's get rid of all this other stuff. It's just not important. Okay. So that's so that's what we have now. Does that make sense? So we have a bunch of symbols in this in this diagram. So we're going to have the taking away of the daily the setting up of the abomination of desolation, and, and we're connecting them to Constantine's Sunday law. Right. Okay. Right. And then we have the edict of Theodosius, just because that one's less known. So that's why I put that one in there. I don't need to put the other ones in. So the fact is we, we end up with all of these different symbols. Right. Which, which is pretty interesting. The, the 70, of course, right, that's a sort of a, a period of probation. There's lots of symbols connected with that. Obviously, July 18. And we know in Millerite history, we have Samuel Snow's last letter published on July 18, 1844, prior to midnight, prior to Boston. And, and my understanding is that the reason he was invited to speak at Boston was because of that letter that was published on right. July 18, right? So I, I don't have proof of that, but that would make the most sense. So he's he's going to um, have that, you know, that published. He's going to be rushing from, I can't remember the name of the town he's in, but it's going to take him all morning starting early on his horse to get to Boston. And that's the one where he would have ridden up on his horse, not Exeter. And, and then he's gonna say it's midnight. I'm now giving the midnight cry, right? But it's not gonna be empowered until Exeter, 25 days later. So the 391 as a symbol, the 187, the 217, and the 70 are all there in this structure, okay? So in, so. in this situation, can share your screen again okay in this situation we have the symbol of the 187 which of course we are applying to july 18th of 2020 we have the symbol of midnight these two things being combined just on their own are fairly powerful but now we have 391 70 and 30 also all involved yeah now, the comment from the chat, I see Daniel 1131 as also predicting the false view of the daily being as corrupt leaven in the church and the sense of Christ's heavenly ministry being obscured and forgotten. This idea of polluting the sanctuary of strength because the Lord, the sanctifier, is the strength of his people and is removed from memory. Do we have any other thought or comment on that? Okay. So we have, it's interesting here, just dealing with sanctuary of strength. Uh, when we add them together, we get 9301. So it's all the digits of 391. Right? Right. And also, if we, and I'm just seeing how we do this here, just making sure my math is right. So the Hebrew numbers are 4720 and 
four, five, eight, one. And if you subtract them, uh, the difference is 139, which is also related to 391. Right. Right. So it's another iteration of, of that. So the 391 pointing to 391 AD, we have basically three witness, I guess, two other witnesses just dealing with the Hebrew numbers, sanctuary of strength. Now, so then it, Angela made that comment there? Yes. Okay. So so I think since she had mentioned this before, not, not directly in this, but trying to look at what the sanctuary of strength is. And um, so these words, obviously it's mikdash, so it's not kodesh. And then we have this word ma'az and uh, for strength. And what was it about that word again? Something about that. Okay, it comes from the word to be stout, um, that is to harden, to be impudent. Okay. Now, of course, it can be, you know, stout in the sense of some kind of uh, fortress or place of safety, a harbor, a stronghold, it can refer to a refuge of God figuratively and also to human protection figuratively. But I, I just don't think that we can apply this here to God's sanctuary in any way. That's 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 my my opinion, right? I mean, we know that God's sanctuary can be polluted as well, uh, but here this is a counterfeit, right? So when we're dealing with the daily and the abomination of desolation, that these are both uh, counterfeits. One of the earthly sanctuary because it has animal sacrifices, paganism. And the other of the heavenly sanctuary, right? That is, uh, uh, papalism is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. It doesn't have animal sacrifices. It, it's paganism uh, draped in Christian garb, right? So it's, it's a different type of, it's still paganism though, right? So, so I, would, I would just take the position that I don't think that we can, I, I, I just don't agree with Angela on this one. Right. Because this is a counterfeit that's being polluted, not the true that's being polluted. So that, that's, you know, that's my take on it. Another comment from the chat. The sanctuary of strength may also be man's mind and his higher nature, question mark. False doctrines pollute the mind. Yeah. It's just, you know, again, my, my view is that this is this is relating to the counterfeit. So it can't be God's sanctuary that's being referred to, or even man, right? That this is paganism that is being taken out of the way, right? And and that's going to be when Clovis's armies stand on the part of papalism, right? That so. So I can't. I can't even take it. Take it as an allusion to something else. Okay, but that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. So, as I'm reading this, we have arms shall stand on his part, and they. So we have a division of parties in verse 31. Yeah. So the arms is the they. That's the military power of France. Well, okay. The arm shall stand on his part. Right. Who have we identified as the his? That, that's the papacy. Okay. So arm shall stand on the part of Rome. Of papal Rome. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And that is the arms of France. That is, that is, um, those that stand on the part of the papacy. That is, they're going to be supporting the papal ideas. So even Theodosius, who's an emperor, in this case, is going to be earlier prior to, to that. But they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. So referring to, referring to the edict of Theodosius. Okay. Right. And they Not shall... Not necessarily be... chronologically, that's all I'm saying. Okay. And they shall take away the daily 
and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Right. So these, this is again, this is France. This is the military, the arms that stand, the support that is given to the papacy. Yeah, and that's going to begin earlier, right? So it, it's not just in 508. That's going to be Clovis in 508. But but there's already this change or this tide that's being turned uh, against paganism and towards uh, the papacy. Okay. Now, as as we had looked at a prior verse, if they are taking away the daily and they are placing the abomination that make desolate, are they not confirming the vision? Okay. Are they so, not establishing the vision? Okay, well, so Rome Rome comes in to establish the vision way earlier. So are you saying that, that the establishing the vision happens here? Okay, <clears throat> we know that Rome establishes the vision way earlier. Yeah, not I'm not arguing that point, mm -hmm. but is it possible that rather than the establishment of the vision being a point in time, that it is a period of time? Well, it is a period, but it's not this time period uh, because this isn't really about Rome. This is about because uh, Rome is falling at this point. Rome pagan is falling, yes. Yeah, so this isn't really pagan Rome that takes away pagan Rome. No, but what we're looking at here is that when pagan Rome is taken away, mm -hmm. that people Rome will then be on the ascendancy. Yeah, but it's nothing to do with establishing the vision because... It has when nothing to do exalts itself to establish the vision is when it first arrives, right? That that's I mean, Rome obviously establishes the vision, but we don't say, you know, that it's it's always establishing the vision every time it does something. That's that's all I would say, is that it's it is a sp particular point in which they exalt themselves. So once they've exalted themselves, they've exalted themselves. They've established the vision. In our time, we put it as papal Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. That's going to be in the history of the 1980s. Right? So that's when it exalts itself to establish the vision. But I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think about what you're saying. But... But I don't see it as Rome here that's exalting itself to establish the vision. The papacy exalts itself, but not, not pagan Rome here. I'm not looking at pagan Rome in this, with the exception of the fact that the daily, the representation of pagan Rome is being taken away. Yeah, it's just that the they is not Rome. In this, in the, in the situation, I'm not saying that the they is pagan or papal Rome, because the his is papal Rome. The they Correct. is is these divisions of Rome as Rome is falling. So if it, you know, it's not written here in chronological order because arms down on his part. That's going to be five oh eight. Uh, but they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. That's five thirty nine. So that's earlier, right? And then again, the, you know, well, we could even say arms down in this part prior to 508, in a sense, Clovis is going to, uh, before he's baptized, he's he's still going to be doing, uh, supporting his military might is going to be supporting uh, papal Rome. But, you know, they, they take away the daily, that's France, right? They shall place the abomination that make it desolate, that's France. So you've got Clovis and... The other guy, um, can't think of his name, Justinian, right? Okay. So Justinian's going to be the one that that gives the abomination of desolation instead of replacing gives it. And um, 
And then it says, you know, uh, in the next verse, it's going to talk about he again, that's going to be the papacy. Right. So the his and the he, the masculine singular, in this case, is going to be referring to the papacy. The they, uh, the plural, is going to be referring to to France primarily, but, but, but just the divisions of Rome, Rome as it's falling. So as it's supporting Christianity, and those in Rome that are supporting Christianity and opposed to paganism. Okay, now a comment from the chat. I wonder whether the 117 years between 391 and 508 has a significance since all the other numbers at do. Perhaps 11.7, Jeff's birthday, is one meaning, or 11 times 7 is 77. Yeah, so, so we understand, actually, that 117 is a shorthand for July 18, in that, you know, we know that uh, 1117 is the 187th prime number, and we know 11 times 17 is 187. And so you can just shorten it by one, right? Take one of the ones away, and you got 11 7, which, you know, symbolizes July 18th and, and also the 777 structure. So, yeah. So, yeah. So we got the 187 years divided into 70 and 117. You know, the, the amazing thing about this, um, you know, when it comes to some of these symbols that we have is that they have these mathematical properties. Like if we had, you know, some other date than July 18, like let's say it was, you know, July 16 or something like that, or July 20th that, that we had made a prediction or July 19th, we wouldn't have had the opportunity for all these mathematical coincidences, right? Especially July 18, 2020, the 1872, the 18720, and, and then all of these other things, you know, the story of Joseph, the 11 and the 17 years, it, it, you know, it's, it's amazing how God has taken these numbers and these dates and has had them all relate to each other. So it, it's like you couldn't have had any other date that than other July 18, 2020. So it's not like we just picked some random date. I mean, all of the symbols that pointed to July 18, 2020 were in a sense independent of each other and yet all witness to each other. And we see that in that diagram there. So now I've added the 11, seven, so 117 years there in the diagram. And so, yeah, so we have all of these symbols that point to July 18th, that point to midnight, that uh, point to a period of probation, um, the point to our, our main symbols, 391. I, I think it's it's yeah, pretty interesting. Well, understand it. Kind of question, how likely yeah. is something like this to occur? Well, I, you know, I've I've done uh, mathematical probabilities on some of the other things that that have happened, and the one thing I can say is that. Uh, the odds that these things are random if are greater than all the particles in the universe, right? So it, it's it's not actually possible that it's random. Okay. So so I mean we take some things on their own, and you have to look at things as independent. So in order to figure out statistical probabilities, uh, you have to you have to see that things are independent in order for them to multiply. Um, so, you know, so there's just so many things about this, like even this structure that we have these symbols, you know, a person could say, well, you could have had other years and other symbols. And that's why you can't have too many symbols, right? So there's a certain number of symbols we have, you know, if every number is a symbol, symbol then it's kind of meaningless. Um, and, and we do have primary symbols and secondary symbols, but here we have really uh, our main primary symbols, July 18, 391, 217, these show up in multiple places. They're prime symbols. And, and even 70 AD, 11, 7 is, it's not really a prime symbol. It's, it's a secondary symbol is that it's something that 
witnesses to like July 18th or the 777 structure, right? The 70 is, is a prime symbol. 30 is, is a prime symbol, right? Now, 321 is also a symbol, but it's it's a secondary symbol because it's uh, it's not it's not um, it's there. Right. Because we got March 7th, 321 for the Sunday law. 321 is a symbol is, is counting down. 321. But it, again, it's a secondary symbol. It, it doesn't really stand on its own. It, it uh, and it's not it's not constantly being witnessed to. Okay. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay. Now, Smith's comment on this. The power of the empire was committed to the carrying on of the work before mentioned. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength or Rome. If this applies to the barbarians, it was literally fulfilled. For Rome was attacked by the Goths, Huns, and Vandals. And the imperial power of the West ceased through the conquest of Rome by Odiacer. So he's saying here the if, if it was literally fulfilled, referring to uh, they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. Right. Like, so he's saying they could have fulfilled that. Okay. Or and if. Then, yeah. Or if it refers to to those rulers of the empire who were working in behalf of the papacy against the pagan and all other opposing religions, it would signify the removal of the seat of the empire from Rome to, Rome to Constantinople, which contributed more than anything else to the downfall of Rome. The passage would then be parallel to Daniel 8.11 and Revelation 13.2. Any comment? Okay, so so here, uh, you know, we can uh, agree with this first part, and 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 we can see Theodosius' is edict um, as part of that. Those that are working on behalf of the papacy against the pagan and all other opposing religions, right? So the edict of Theodosius, it would fulfill that. Now he's going to then refer to the removal of the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople. Now, and and that could be part of it. I mean, we could include part of that as part of it, though I don't think that that's primarily what's being addressed. But but um, it's, it's a possibility. Now, then he's going to refer to Daniel eight verse eleven. Now he's not going to expound on that, is he? Or is he going no. on the next? Part? He's going to start dealing. They shall take away the daily. So he's going to refer more to Daniel eight thirteen later. Right. right. Um, so in Daniel 8, 11, it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host is what the King James says, but it's against the prince of the host. So 5704. Not to. I mean, you could translate it as to, I guess, in the sense of against. So and, and from him. That is from that is from the. So from him, the daily was taken away. So it says by him, the daily was taken away, but it's going to be taken from who? Who's the going to daily going to be taken away from? I'm going to say this. Wouldn't that be pagan Rome? Okay. Yeah. So the, so the daily is going to be taken away from pagan Rome, right? So who magnifies himself against the prince of the host first, I guess, is the... Doesn't pagan Rome magnify itself, himself against the prince of the host? Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Right, because this isn't talking about the papacy. It's no. The heat. And we know earlier in verse 10, it's going to talk about it. It is going to refer, that's feminine. It's going to refer to the papacy because this little horn is masculine and feminine. When it's masculine, it refers to pagan Rome. When it's feminine, it refers to papal Rome. So it's pagan Rome that magnifies himself against the prince of the host. And then it says, from him, that is from pagan Rome, the daily was taken away. Now we know that word taken away is room, 
which means lifted up and exalted, right? So it's going to be the papacy that's going to lift up and exalt paganism. But it's not taken away by the papacy, right? So it's going to be taken, the daily is going to be taken away by France, right? It's going to remove that. And then they're going to place uh, and place the sanctuary and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this is Rome's sanctuary being taken away. So this is, he's, he's equating this with the polluting of the sanctuary of strength. Now, if the place of his sanctuary was cast down or thrown down, the sanctuary here we, is the, the pantheon, right? right. The place yes. of his sanctuary is Rome. So the place of his sanctuary that is cast down is Rome. And then we're going to have in verse 12, and a host was given him against the daily by transgression, and it cast down the truth. It's going to be that same word, cast down. It cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. This is an it. And a host was given. It has him in italics in the King James because it's not masculine. So a host was given it, I would put, or her, the papacy, against the daily. And it cast down, that is the papacy cast down the truth to the ground. And it practiced and prospered. Right. So so we, we could sort of equate that with 8 verse 11, but it's not so much about the removal of the capital from Rome to Constantinople, right? As as he tries to make it. Right. right. It's more about basically the fall of Rome, not just the removal of the seat of the empire. Okay. So hopefully that helps, that analysis helps people. Now, Smith had continued. <clears throat> uh, can I, uh, you, you, you said that, you're saying that France is the one that takes away the daily from pagan Rome and gives it to papacy. Yeah, yeah. All right. It's, it's France that does that. It's it's Clovis and Justinian, right? Okay. And they shall take away the daily sacrifice. It was shown in Daniel 8.13 that sacrifice is a word erroneously supplied and that it should be desolation. Where do we see that this should be desolation, the daily desolation? Is that, I, I don't see that in the Hebrew. I don't see that in. Well, well it's actually, it is, it, it's, um, you got two desolations, the daily and the transgression of desolation. So we do that in English too. We don't have to always supply the word desolation. You know, we could say, and by him, the daily desolation was taken away. He just says the daily, right? But in, uh, but it talks about the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation. They're both desolating powers. So it's, it's a daily desolation and a abomination of desolation. I just find, for my mind, in having these two separated the way that this is, the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate, for me it clarifies that we're talking <clears throat> two separate powers. Okay. All I know is the Millerites understood it this way. They had the two desolating powers, the daily and the abomination. Right. So they, they took the death daily as a desolating power as well as as the abomination of desolation. But, you know, maybe maybe they shouldn't have done that. But that's what they did. Right. So so what he's stating here is, is exactly what Miller says. OK. Um, and so as he continued and that the expression denotes a desolating power of which the abomination of desolation is but the counterpart, and to which it succeeds in point of time. 
Yeah, so he believes in the 2520 then, if he follows his logic. But he's he's rejected his the understanding of the seven times, but you're right. His it, it's very direct here. So that would mean that he would not only be accepting of the seven times of Leviticus 26, he would be applying the cow's own vision. Yeah. Now, so so Miller did it, of course, as we noted, a bit differently because, you know, he he started the daily not with Assyria, but with Babylon. Right. Right. So he's going to start it in 677. He's going to have that 1,215 years, and then he's going to add the 45 years at the end. Even though he did recognize there was a 2520 for northern Israel, if he had just, you know, thought a little bit further. But of course, you know, it wasn't the time to understand that. But still, the idea that there are these two desolating powers, and they're both for a time, times and a half, as Miller acknowledged, right? It's just that he divided that time, times and a half for the daily in to 12, 15, and 45, which really makes no sense. But yeah, so if they had thought a little bit further, they would have been able to see the 2520. And, and Uriah Smith should have been familiar with Hiram Edson's application. But again, it's just... Sometimes people don't see things, and, and for various reasons. Sometimes it's not time to see it. Like we didn't see the 187 and the 217 and the 391 and the 70 and the 11, the 7, uh, you know, in well, to yesterday and today, right? So, so sometimes we just don't see things that are right in front of us. So Smith isn't seeing what he's saying. Okay. Now... Smith continues, the daily desolation is paganism. The abomination of desolation is the papacy. Here, Smith could easily have applied that the daily 1260 and the abomination of desolation 1260 make up the seven times of Leviticus 26. But his pride was such that he shows his reliance on the word of man versus the word of God. Smith continues, but it may be asked how this can be the papacy since Christ spoke of it in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem. And the answer is Christ evidently referred to the ninth of Daniel, which is a prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem, and not the verse of the 11th, which does not refer to the event. Daniel in the ninth chapter speaks of desolations and abominations, plural. More than one abomination, therefore, treads down the church. That is, so far as the church is concerned, both paganism and the papacy are abominations. But as distinguished from each other, the language is restricted and one is the daily desolation, and the other is preeminently the des transgression of abomination of desolation. Any other thought or comment on this? Well, I actually don't agree with his answer. I don't think... I don't agree a, with it. it. It's not a good answer. So um, what he should have done is referred to the typical nature of the destruction of Jerusalem. So we can see that it typifies what's going to happen. Now, now we know that, of course, uh, Christ speaks of it, but also we have um, Paul speaking of it in 2 Thessalonians. Right. So it has to be the same thing that he's talking about. Now, it is true that it is Daniel 9, Right. But also, we know that, that, that they're connected. You, you can't take, um, you know, Daniel 11, 41 or 12, 11 and, and, and Daniel chapter 8, verse 13 and, and, and make them something different. 
They're, they're really talking about the same thing. And so in Second Thessalonians, um, when Paul says, uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. So we're going to have these later verses. We're going to have this continuation as we go through Daniel chapter 11. Paul is referring to that, right? And and, and then he's going to talk about the mystery of iniquity doth already work, right? He also talks about he who now hinders will continue to do so until he be taken out of the way. So, so there's something that the mystery of iniquity is already working, um, but the power that's hindering it is pagan Rome. And once he's taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, in this sort of bigger sketch of things, that is, when when we look at um, the destruction of Jerusalem, that is a way mark connected to the cross. That is, you have the cross in the midst of the week. You have the stoning of Stephen, the close of probation in 34 AD. And then you have the execution of, of the judgment against the Jews with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, right? So you have this pro this line that's a progression, but we know that that's typical, right? We can see that that's a reform line. Now, Smith doesn't really quite understand that. He doesn't understand the typical nature of, of these lines, right? He doesn't understand these lines. So Christ is both speaking about the destruction of the Jer Jerusalem and the end of the world, right? He's not speaking just about the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah, I, I don't think I could see how he could be. Yeah. And, and Ellen White, when she puts together the great controversy, you know, I, I don't think we always really appreciate the way that she has written it. Because she's going to start with the chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem. That's going to be the first chapter of the great controversy. And then we have the chapter two deals with the perse persecution in the first centuries. And then finally, chapter three is going to deal with the taking away of the daily and the setting up the abomination of desolation. And, and when she deals with the chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem, she's really clear on the typical nature of, of what Christ is saying. Right. So she's going to go uh, to Christ's words about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and clearly show that this is talking about the end of the world. But it's 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 couched in this symbolism about something that literally is going to occur, but is typical. So it, it's quite interesting. The book Great Controversy uh, is really, really well structured uh, prophetically. But I don't think Adventists really appreciate everything Ellen White wrote there. Okay. How is the daily or paganism taken away? As this is spoken of in connection with the placing or setting up the abomination of desolation or the papacy, it must denote not merely the nominal change of religion of the empire from paganism to Christianity, as on the conversion so-called of Constantine, but such an eradication of paganism from all the elements of the empire that the way would be open for all the papal, for the papal abomination to arise and assert its arrogant claims. Such a revolution as this, plainly defined, was accomplished, but not for nearly 200 years after the death of Constantine. As we approach the year 580, 508, we behold a grand crisis ripening between Catholicism and the pagan influences still existing in the empire. Up to the time of the conversion of Clovis, King of France, AD 496, the French and the other nations of Western Rome were pagan. But subsequent to that effect, to that event, the efforts to convert idolaters to Christ were crowned with great success. The conversion of Clovis is said to have been the occasion of bestowing upon the French monarch the titles of most Christian majesty and the eldest son of the church. Between the time 
and AD 508 by alliances, capitulations, and conquests, the Arabici, the Roman garrisons in the west, Brittany, the Burgundians, and the Visigoths were brought into subjection. Now, now we know that Clovis wasn't actually converted in 496. So right. that date is just traditionally what they had uh, based on a certain, I can't remember the writer's name, um, but we have uh, a contemporary writer who gives us the date of December 25th, 508 for his baptism. So, so the co conversion of Clovis, when you look at all of the documentation and so forth, they just have the wrong date, 496. But that's not something that Uriah Smith could have known. Okay. So, you know, and the other thing, the other thing which, which I'm going to just mention again, is that, um, so we know that we have, we still have to sort out exactly the details of this history because there are so many different opinions about the date 508 and 538, what, why we have those dates. Okay. Right. And, and we know that, that Miller, uh, was given the date 508. Right. So there's three dates that he was given, 508, 6, 677, and 457 BC, and 508 AD, right? So there's three dates, and, and yet his reasonings for 508 aren't necessarily correct. That Miller's reasons for 508 are not necessarily correct, or that Smith's reasons are not Miller's, correct? Miller's reasons. Okay. Because he doesn't have the event that we have, neither does Smith. Right, the baptism of Clovis, right. which I think is the event that marks 508. Because there, there's so many different theories, even within the Millerites themselves and in Adventists afterwards, of how we establish these dates. We know the dates are correct, but the events that mark those dates are still not, there's not a big agreement on them, you know. And, and some of them definitely are incorrect because, you know, things that are supposed to have happened at such and such a date didn't actually happen at those dates. So that's, that's one of the reasons why there's been, you know, doubt placed upon the 1290 and the 1335 because none of the events that people mark as happening in 508 actually happen in 508. Now it's kind of interesting in in looking at this, this Arborici that's being referred to by Smith, mm -hmm. when you go to look this up, the spelling is very different mm -hmm. because it is A R B O R Y C H O R C H O I. So Arborichoi. Arboricho, Aborichon? Okay. They were a people mentioned by Procopius as living in Gaul in the 5th century AD. And there is no consensus as to who they were. Yeah, that's the guy's name, Procopius. Okay. Uh, right. So he's the guy uh, where I think we get, uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, so he's he's um, he's one of the writers. I think he's the one that gives us 496. If I'm, I, I, I'm so bad with names, <clears throat> getting these all mixed up. So Procopius, just hang on. So he he's one of the writers anyway that that writes about this history. Okay. I'm just not sure. I can't remember if he's the one who's got the right date or the wrong date. Well, I think, I'm pretty sure he's the one with the wrong date, but I could be wrong. Procopius mentions this people in his description of the land and peoples west of the Lower Rhine. Based on his description, they would have occupied the coast of what is today Belgium. <clears throat> Writing in the 550s, he probably got his information from a Frankish emissary. It forms part of a passage explaining the origins of the Franks and their power. 
It should probably be associated insofar as his garbled account is historical with the reigns of the Frankish kings Kilderic I and Clovis I. The Aboric Choi are described as having been federate of the Roman Empire. They are said to have changed their form of government, probably meaning they came to recognize rulers other than the Roman emperors. They fought an inconclusive war with the Franks before allying and intermarrying with them, becoming one people. They were both Christians, in other words, Caldonians or Chalcedonians, not Arians, at this time, and it situates it after the conversion of Clovis. So in his own day, Procopius writes, the descendants of the Aboric Choi still mustered according to the old Roman muster rolls and carried their own ba- their old banners. So is it from Procopius that we get this on, Clovis, or do we get this from Gibbons on Clovis? Well, well Gibbons is just repeating uh, Procopius. Okay. So basically what Smith is saying is between A.D. 496 and 508, the Bo- Aboric Choi, the Roman garrisons in the West, in Brittany, the Burgundians and the Visigoths were all brought into subjection. From the time when these successes were fully accomplished, namely 508, the papacy was triumphant so far as paganism was concerned. For though the latter doubtless retarded the progress of the Catholic faith, yet it had not the power, if it had the disposition, to suppress that faith and hinder the encroachments of the Roman pontiff. When the prominent powers of Europe gave up their attachment to paganism, it was only to perpetuate the abominations in another form, for Christianity in the Catholic sense was only paganism baptized. In England, Arthur, the first Christian king, founded the Christian worship on the ruin of the pagan. Rapine, who claims to be exact in the chronology of events, states that he was elected monarch of Britain in 508. Book the second, page 124. Yeah, so this idea of King Arthur um, in 508, it's definitely not supported by any kind of modern scholarship. That this, there's no no source dark documents to support this, but anyway, wasn't well known in uh, Uriah Smith's day about that. Kind of interesting that Smith would be the type of a loose cannon on this point. What do you mean? Well, like you just said, modern scholarship would not support this regarding Arthur Pendragon. Yeah, but it wasn't in his day that wasn't really an issue in at the time when he wrote this. Uh, you know, it, it's it's in the pioneer writings as well. So he he's just repeating what the pioneers have said. Okay. Right. So if we look at it here, it's so Uriah Smith mentions it. It's in um, the Signs of the Times in 1842. The Himes, Signs of the Times, December of 1842. It's also in uh, the Review and Herald in December of 1852 and 1858. And seen any other places, so. Yeah, so Uriah Smith and the Pioneers do mention Arthur in 508. Okay. The condition of the See of Rome was also peculiar at this time. In 498, Samahias, 
ascended to the pontifical throne as a recent convert from paganism. He reigned to A.D. 514. He found his way to the papal chair, says Dupin, by, sur by str striving with his competitor even unto blood. He received adulation as the successor of St. Peter and struck the keynote of papal assumption by presuming to excommunicate the emperor Anastasius. The most servile flatterers of the Pope now became now began to maintain that he was constituted judge in the place of God and that he was the vice regent of the Most High. So normally I would pull out a book that I have on the different popes, but I've got it buried for the moment. So I'm looking to determine who was the pope in that year, at least what's recorded. Yeah. But anyway, uh, just while you're doing that, so we know that Miller talks about 508, and he's going to have, that's when the, the pagan sacrifices ceased at Rome, which, which I don't think there's any support for. I think I looked into this before. So that's, and, and he bases that on, in 508, the daily sacrifice was taken away. So he's just going to say, well, that's when the sacrifice has ceased. But there's not support for that idea. But we do have the baptism of Clovis, which um, which I think is uh, the bigger point. Right. So other people, because they couldn't support 508 for the taking away of the daily sacrifice in a literal sense, Right. Then they found other uh, events that they tried to match with 508. I'm trying to see what uh, some people have Justinian conquering the Ostrogoths in 508. Yeah. So, yeah, there's something we have to look look at in more detail to understand all the different views. But I think when we look at Daniel 11 here, the thing that we see you know, what we had found there dealing with uh, 391 and 70 and the 11 and 7 and 187 and 217, uh, that actually makes a lot more sense. So when we address, you know, what what Smith is trying to address here, he, he it seems like he's throwing everything he can at 508 to see what's going to stick. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. And I think that's what Adventists tend to do um, with 508 and, and even 538. Now, the other thing that we had, which is, is later on, is uh, the next verse. Uh, you know, we're going to be dealing with um, the Council of Orleans in 538. So when we start dealing with 538, we have some other events as well. Um, so there's lots, lots of different details that we've noticed that we have to put together to show 508 and 538. So, so you're trying to find who's, who's the Pope? I found it. Okay. Okay. Kind of interesting. The man's name is Samakas. He was born on the Mediterranean island of Sardinia that was then under Vandal rule. The son of Fortunatus. It was noted that he was born a pagan and was perhaps the rankest outsider of all the Ostrogothic popes, most of whom were members of the arist aristocratic families. Symmachus was baptized in Rome, where he became the archdeacon of the Roman Church under Pope Anastasius II, who ruled from 496 to 498. Now, this papacy ended on the 19th of July of 514 AD. He was elected pope on the 22nd of November of 498. They have a second, the archpriest of Santa Casade, 
Laurentius was elected Pope on the same day at the Basilica of St. Mary by a dissenting faction with Byzantine sympathies who were supported by the Eastern Roman Emperor Anastasius. Both factions agreed to allow the Gothic king Theodoric the Great to arbitrate. He ruled that the first one who was elected first he, okay, excuse me. He ruled that the one who was elected first and whose supporters were the most numerous would be recognized as Pope. This was purely a political decision. An investigation favored Symmachus and his election was recognized as proper. However, an early document known as the Laurentian Fragment claims that Symmachus obtain the decision by paying bribes. While Deacon Magnus, Felix, and Nodius of Milan later wrote that 400 soldi were distributed amongst influential, influential personages whom it would be indiscreet to name. Now the soldus was a highly pure gold coin issued in the later Roman Empire. So in other words, the accusation is being made that he bought the papacy by paying out gold. So, so it's kind of interesting that <clears throat> this papacy began on the 22nd of November of 496, or 498, excuse me, and ended 19th of July of 514. So <clears throat> it's intriguing that they would allow a, a goth to arbitrate the decision as to who was to be Pope. And that then this party, Symmachus, decides that he wants to act to excommunicate the Emperor Anastasius. Well, the question I have is, what does this have to do with what he's talking about here, though? Like, I don't quite understand, because he's just saying this is the guy who's the Pope in 508, but he's nothing to do with the taking away of the daily. No, it doesn't. But he's, he's trying to say how corrupt things were in the, in in the Roman Church at that time. Okay, well, but they were corrupt before then. Correct. And after, so it's not really anything new. Such was the direction in which events were tending in the West. What posture did affairs at the same time assume in the East? A strong papal party now existed in all parts of the empire. The adherents of this cause in Constantinople, encouraged by the success of their brethren in the West, deemed it safe to commence open hostilities in behalf of their master at Rome. In 508, their partisan zeal culminated in a whirlwind of fanaticism and civil war, which swept in fire and blood through the streets of the eastern capital. Given, under the years 508 to 514, speaking of the commotions in Constantinople, says, the statutes, statutes, st statues of the emperor were broken and his person was concealed in a suburb till at the end of three days, he dared to implore the mercy of his subjects. Without his diadem and in the posture of a suppliant, Anastasius appeared on the throne of the circus. The Catholics before his face rehearsed the genuine Tisigian. They exulted in the offer which he was proclaimed by the voice of a herald of abdicating the purple. They listened to the admonition that since all could not reign, they should previously agree in the choice of a sovereign and they accepted the blood of two unpopular ministers whom their master, without hesitation, condemned to the lions. These furious but transient seditious were encouraged by the success of Vitalian. 
who with his army of Huns and Bulgarians, for the most part idolaters, declared himself the champion of the Catholic faith. In this pious rebellion, he depopulated Thrace, besieged Constantinople, exterminated 65,000 of his fellow Christians till he obtained the recall of the bishops, the satisfaction of the Pope, and the establishment of the Council of Chalcedon, an Orthodox treaty reluctantly signed by the dying Anastasius and more faithfully performed by the uncle of Justinian. And such was the event of the first of the religious wars which had been waged in the name and by the disciples of the God of Peace. Gibbons, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4, page 526. Let it be marked that in the year 508, paganism had so far declined and Catholicism had so far relatively increased in strength that the Catholic Church for the first time waged a successful war against both the civil authority of the empire and the Church of the East, which had for the most part embraced the monophysite doctrine. The extermination of 65 heretics thousand heretics was the result so here is smith he is giving a lot of background but not really a lot of supremely pertinent information as to the why of 508 Mm -hmm. yeah why specifically 508 so any other thoughts or comment at this time Well, yeah, just that we're really going to have to study this history better. Right. So, you know, I know Stephen's been studying this history, so at some point we'll probably have him do a study on it. But there's so many different views for 508. I mean, that's why um, we know that uh, uh, Heidi Hikes, he put uh, together, well, a series of books uh, dealing with this topic where he he has his own explanations for 508 and 538 that uh, agree with the new view of the daily. and But he, he still he has all kinds of problems with his position as well. One is it doesn't recognize uh, the daily being paganism, but, but even just how he puts together those dates, it, it doesn't really make sense. But but that's a whole other study. Right. Okay, now we've come to the close of our time together today. Any other comments or thoughts? I mean, as I as I see it, and I agree, we're going to have to look better at this history to more firmly establish 508. So, any other comment? Well, well I was going to comment. Okay, go, Angela. Oh, Fizzites didn't believe in the humanity of Christ much as much sorry, much as some people today don't believe that Christ took on, on our, our fallen natures. So they're like the pre precursors of those in the SDA church who don't accept that Christ took on a sinful nature. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, we're gonna have to look at this uh in a lot more detail. And you know, I'm gonna try to get some of my documents together on this. Because, yeah, there's just so much disagreement and so much confusion. I don't think not only cannot the average, average Adventist explain these dates, but I don't think any of us can. I don't think we have a good understanding of this history. And, and so we need to spend some time looking at the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation, the events that mark this and the different views and get this straight in our minds. I would agree. Okay. If there's no other comment or question, shall we close our session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we have come to a point that for today we must leave aside. Help us to consider the points that we have discussed today. Direct us in the steps that you would have us to take. May your will be done. May your name be glorified. In all that we do, direct us now, help us to return again so that we may 
continue to look to understand that which you have written. I thank you for each one that has been at this meeting today. I thank you for those that will view this meeting later. May your blessing be upon us all. For this, we thank you, and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.